My name's Bryony Anderson and I'm a puppet maker. I've just finished making a thylacine puppet for a production of The Dream of the Thylacine. So I've been working on this puppet for months up in the bush and today is the day when I bring it down to Sydney and present it to the puppeteers and the director and the people who've been building the set and it all comes together for the first time in a, um, a stumbling first steps sort of way. My name's Scott Wright, I'm a theatre director. I'm the artistic director of theatre group Earth. My role in Dream of the Thylacine is both as director but also as the catalyst, as the, the instigator of the project. Two years ago I was in Hobart and I picked up a copy of the book at the Tasmanian um, Museum. It's a very beautiful book, it's a very cathartic book and I immediately saw the potential to, to turn it into a performance. As you probably know, quadrupeds are kind of tricky. But really the process from that point on was actually to tr track down the author, the illustrator, which is Margaret Wilde and Ron Brooks, and ask their permission. The book is essentially a picture book with 126 words. And the aim is to recreate the book without interpretation. For me, it was very easy to hand over a copy of the book and say to the workshop that I wanted them to be inspired by it. The first thing was muttering something about a thylacine and I thought, hmm, quadruped, furry, hmm. <laughs> and then he said, have a look at this book, which I took home and it was um, perplexing and interesting. And that gave me the beginnings of a way in. This is the original just Benny form, looking at strange back end. And I sketch, but I also scribble. It's very important all the way through from um, conceptual form and design as a way of communicating with whoever's commissioned the puppet first off. Is this what you mean? Is this what I'm making for you? It was always to be based as closely as possible on anatomical realism. The size of the puppet is um, the best estimate of a fully grown female, which was the last known thylacine. It was a female called Benjamin. There are three images in the book that are black and white um, stills taken from old footage. We've tracked down the original footage and we're going to be using that footage to try to recreate the movements of the thylacine. Yes. Yes. It's very Australian marsupial yeah. as well. See, because it's in such a small space, we keep seeing it going one, two, three, four. Like... One thing that I watched over and over and over again was the remnant footage of the last known thylacine pacing and, and leaping at the bars, which um, was very important for understanding the anatomy and the movement. It seems to have a much more flexible spine than a normal dog. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's not a canine. It it's not, really not a dog. No. One thing that I was struck by in watching the footage and reading about it was um, its otherness. In some ways it's a dog, but in other ways it's, it comes from an ancient lineage yeah, that's completely different. There's something quite unfathomable about their faces particularly and their, their movement. While that one follows that one. I wanted to bring that through in the puppet because I think that may have influenced how settlers reacted to them, that uh, otherness brings fear and a reaction to that is to try to wipe out the source of that fear. It's about bringing that puppet to life. It's not about telling any other story than the story of, that the audience will get by being present. So you have the idea, which is to make the show, and everybody has to converge with each other via that idea. As a director, it's my job to filter those contributions. And what I've learned as a director is that the less you try to manipulate people's contributions, 
the greater the outcome is. There's a little weight down here, so just, just in there. Mm -hmm. Some sandbags, just so that it has that kind of strength to it. So I go from research and sketching into a one-to-one -one scale model where I work out the lengths of joints and limbs and how they relate to each other. And then I build a very rough prototype, which is just figuring out things like what needs to spring, what needs to flex, what can be pulled to um, create motion. This is a big head scratching day. How to make the back legs move move three joints simultaneously off one string. As I'm solving problems, I'll, I'll kind of draw a possible solution, test it either in my mind or with prototypes, and then I'll, I'll mark in my book, you know, that didn't work. I keep a tally of my hours so that I can get a better and better sense of how long different processes take. Jaw and ears. So when you feel it kind of resist at the end, that's when this pulls all the way back here. I photograph steps, which is important for me uh, in future processes, but also when people ring me up saying, it's an hour till the show and its leg won't work, then I can call up those photos and say, I think, you know, if you cut through the fur here, try this joint, that might be the problem. The skeleton gets covered in a kind of um, the form and then the flesh and then a skin and then the fur over the skin. So it's layer upon layer. In learning about the thylacines and in hearing about Scott's explorations in Tasmania, I started to understand that thylacines hold a special place in history and in people's subconscious somehow. And they're almost a revered object of uh, worship, almost. Not quite the right word. But I felt like it would be quite sacrilegious to just cover it in fun fur and call it done. And so I started to look for um, materials that were, uh, could pay homage to that um, special place that they hold. And I was thinking about um, settlers who were responsible for the extermination of the thylacine, living in very small shacks with access to very few resources. I wanted to bring some of that into the thylacine itself and looking around at available materials, I um, saw potential in potato sacks, <laughs> which uh, with lots and lots of handwork could be turned into fur. I was really struck by the thylacine jaw pincushion. It's a settler's artefact and it's grotesque and beautiful and strange and, and led to that whole thought process about settlers and isolation and hardship and making do, coupled with fear of that dark wildness out there and how you react to that by extermination. There's a distinct moment when you're making puppets where it, it becomes not a collection of objects anymore but a, a, a life. And often that's when you put the eyes in and it looks at you for the first time. But sometimes it's in a motion that uh, you combine a bunch of joints, you pick it up and you move them and it, for a moment it's alive. That's something that I hope for as well in the final product is in spite of an obviously handcrafted object, that there can be a moment where uh, the audience will catch their breath because it has that spark of life. In it. A puppet needs somewhere to live. In our work, we often think of the set as being a puppet as well. It has a life, it changes, it does things. It not only is a place that the puppet inhabits, but it's also a place that transforms. At one moment it may be a cage that a thylacine is kept in, but other times it could be the Tasmanian wilderness. The story is full of pathos, but I hope that the puppet itself will bring on something more complex than just pity. Because um, it is a beast, the thylacine. Its situation is pathetic and terrible, but 
the creature itself is not. If the audience cries at the end of the show, then we've done our job. That sadness or that um, empathy will be rewarded because the thylacine comes back to life and, and goes into the audience and gives the audience a chance to have a physical connection. For that brief moment, it's close. You can touch it. You, know, you, you, you would imagine, you, you could believe that it's really smelling you and smelling the air.